All right. Well, why don't we get started? Uh, thank you for coming to my session. We're going to talk about dynamic but safe operations. And really, really what we're going to talk about is uh, using AI to generate trusted operations. Um, and I'll set a little context and stage. Um, my name is Michael Watson. Uh, I uh, lead developer relations at Apollo. Um, I've been working with GraphQL since about 2018. Um, really, I'm obsessed with GraphQL APIs. Uh, it's, I think it's the only way to build APIs these days. Uh, that's just me. Uh, but let's get into what we're going to talk about today. You know, one of the big things I've seen as a trend, platform APIs, platform engineering, really a focus on how can we help developers be more effective in getting their first feature to production faster. And so let's, let's go through this a little bit. So we're, we're a little software developer, right? And we write code, and we join a new team, right? So all right, we're going to you know, start at this new project. And uh, we get assigned our first task, right? A new feature that's going to be built in our app. We got a date of when we're going to present it to the team and get to show off this new feature. So the question is, how can we help that individual developer, right? That's what I was talking about. How do we get them to get that first feature to production and really focus on what are the things do they need to do that? And ideally, in a self-service way. Right? You want that developer to focus on the feature they're building, not the details of the business processes, the integrations, the whatever else that's part of that. So how can we help them? You know, and that's why platform APIs have really started to arise and become a, a, a big standard. You know, if you think about uh, infrastructure operations, developer operations, to platform engineering where we are, it's really just an evolution of trying to make the individual developer more effective in building out their features. Right? And if, if you're here and you do have platform APIs, you know, what are you building them with? GraphQL, of course. Right? Um, you know, one of the reasons I think GraphQL has been prevalent in platform APIs is really the strong standard of graphical, GraphQL Playground, um, Apollo Explorer. There's a lot of tools out there, but this portal that gives you insight into all of your APIs, all of your data. Right? And now we see internal developer portals and wanting to put you know, graphical or Apollo Explorer inside of Backstage, for example. Right? So this is increasing more and more. So we're going to take a journey. Um, we're going to look at GitHub. Uh, so GitHub's APIs, I think, are a really good example. Uh, everyone is, knows about GitHub. It also powers a lot of traffic. You know, a lot of people use the GitHub APIs, whether that's through the clients and those are actually making API calls or not. So where GitHub's uh, starting point of where we're going to talk about is their REST API, so their v3. And there's a couple things uh, that I think GitHub really did to try and get people to more effectively consume their APIs. Right? They started adding in you know, a simple curl command. Right? So it was very connected into people like, oh, I just run this curl command. Um, but you can also see there's you know, API endpoints and a lot of different types here on the side. Right, so I have to start doing some navigation, some searching. And then they went to v4 of their API. And that's where they started doing GraphQL. And you can notice some drastic differences from their documentation right off the bat. There's no longer any types off here on the side, right? It seems a simpler interface. And I think really the magic sauce of what we have here is the integration of Explorer here. Right? And that's where, when you click on that, it's actually a graphical representation. Right? Graphical is just right there inside the documentation. And the big drastic contrast between this and the REST API is not so much that I can explore my graph and understand my APIs. Yes, I can do that. But it's that I can execute. It's that I can sign in. And I can execute that request right there and see that data coming back. Because when I'm building my iOS app, I'm not so worried of like, oh, if I make this API call, I'm going to get the data back. Like, I can figure all the things out on my end if I know that it's working. Right? So if I can figure out working in this little sandbox playground, and then I make the GraphQL query in my iOS app and use my normal tools and everything, everything's good. So I have a playground that gives me this opportunity to, to start exploring into that. But we quickly start to face another challenge. Look how many types are in this graph. GitHub schema is so big. It's like 30,000 lines of code. Uh, in the context of AI, what we're talking about right now, it's over 300,000 context tokens. To give you a concept of what that means, ChatGPT 4.0, the pricing of it, a million tokens, $5, 300,000 tokens, like $1.30, right? 
So if you, for example, I have people say this all the time, oh, the context window for LMs are going to get so big that you can just give a whole GraphQL schema to it. All right, well, that's $1.30 every time you're doing that. And I've talked with GitHub engineers, the internal GitHub schema is much larger than this also. Right, so what, what, what can we do? There's another challenge on top of this. We're that new dev coming to that team. I'm also new to GraphQL. I'm not only new to your organization, I'm also new to GraphQL. So we have this additional challenge that happens, right? And we're faced with that because we're commonly the people bringing GraphQL into the organization, right? So we're now starting to support those developers that are expanding onto the graph, right? What's the number one question they come and ask? Hey, how do I get this from the API? Because I'm trying to build this feature thing and I need to get that data for that feature thing, right? That makes a ton of sense. So what do we do? We make some office hours. All right, so our platform team then creates some office hours to where we can you know, answer those questions and everything. And I'm not saying we should get rid of office hours. I think it's a great way, especially with virtual, for us to you know, meet our colleagues at our companies and everything like that. But I think there's a better format for it. And if our managers come and see this, you, you know the question they're going to ask, right? Whoops. Hey, can we use AI for that or something? You know? Maybe AI could just like be put in here. I've been hearing AI. Everyone, you know, I'm sure every single person in this room, your boss, your company, your project, there's some AI mandate theme that's somewhere everywhere. Um, I think that's kind of what everyone has. And I, I think there's a really responsible way of how we can bring this in. But like, you can't just bring it in any way, right? You can't just say, hey, let's use AI. So you know what? Hey, all right, let's do it, manager. Let's, let's get Copilot. So I say, hey, I, I need to get this stuff from the you know, GitHub API, right? And I put the open API specification inside of here, because we're doing REST in this example. And now it starts to give me a little explanation. OK, it's not exactly what I was hoping for, but that's, oh, now I'm getting some code. Cool. All right. AI is helping us. But wait, we don't use JavaScript. We use TypeScript. So let's go back to that. All right. So then I just say, hey, wait, Copilot, no problem. Can you give this to me in TypeScript? It's like, sure. All right, no explanation. This is getting better. Uh, we don't use Axios. OK. All right, well, it's still a step forward. I mean, that slice isn't going to work for our pagination, but we're getting there, right? But here's the thing. GraphQL is naturally better for AI. It's easier to understand. You've heard this probably through some other themes and some other talks because of the specification, because the strongly typed aspect of GraphQL. Because the GraphQL spec is in the training data set for LLMs, it is very easy for it to understand. It is a very machine readable aspect for LLMs. So simply just saying, hey, here's the GraphQL schema. Can, can you write me an operation for that? It's actually pretty good at doing that. right? It actually writes a proper operation for that. That's pretty impressive. Like that's, you know, we're not doing anything fancy here. We're just using Copilot, right? And we're getting a significantly better result. This is also one of the reasons why GraphQL is better than REST. I mean, you know, we're not better than REST. It's complementary. You know. But um, I'm a big fan of GraphQL. And I'm OK with saying that, like, I think GraphQL is better than REST. And this is one of the reasons why, as a client developer, we love GraphQL. I just got to worry about writing a query. I don't got to worry about all the other details that were part of that code that Copilot was writing. So LMs can easily understand GraphQL. And the question comes, can we actually provide a GraphQL-aware context to any LLM? Right? You hear a lot about, oh, do we have to train LLMs on this custom data? What about not training it? Can we just actually make it maybe GraphQL-aware and have it understand our APIs? I think the answer is yes. So I'm going to talk about uh, something I've been kind of investigating with some other engineers at Apollo. And I think this is a, a really powerful tool that works with just any GraphQL schema. It uses a strategy called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. And what this really means is we're taking a GraphQL schema. And we're breaking apart the definitions of that parse schema. And we're creating vector representations of those into a vector store. All right, and we're using some embedding model. There's lots of embeddings models out there, OpenAI, Olama. We'll actually show some of that in just a minute. But we need to use some embedding model to take that text and turn it into that vector. Now, once we have that, the way it works is we can now actually take that question from that developer. How do I get what from an API? We can use that same embedding model to take that question and turn it into a vector representation. And then we can actually do a vector search across that store 
and understand what are the relevant pieces of the schema that are associated with that question. And then we can ask the LM, hey, can you generate the operation from that? So think about that copilot situation. It had the whole schema. What if we actually just use some vector search to actually provide the relevant portions of the schema in a specific set of documents um, to get that same operation? And then, you know, if you want to take it even a step further, you can probably have something execute that request in a similar fashion of what that GitHub Explorer uh, example was. So a lot of fun stuff there. But, you know, sometimes I feel like with everything here, it looks cool on a big architecture diagram, but like, how do you do this? There's probably a lot of details in there. It's actually really simple, but that's the best part. And we're going to look at that right now, straight into demo. OK. So what I have here on the screen is that GitHub schema. Now, like I said, remember, it's really long, really, really, really long, right? But there's a couple things that GitHub has done really great. And this is actually important for AI understanding our APIs. Um, actually, I believe uh, um, in the keynote this morning from IBM, they even mentioned about uh, adding comments in your GraphQL schema, how important that is. It actually is really important. Um, adding GraphQL comments and giving an understanding of what is going on each one of those little pieces of schema is actually very helpful for LLMs. and actually becomes part of what that individual definition is. There's also a lot of other things that you can do inside of here. Um, one of the things I like to talk about, uh, just to get a little into it, when you start talking about, you know, there's a comment that we can add. There's actually a lot more you can also add into your scheme to provide more metadata inside of there. One is even thinking of the arguments that you're putting in there, right? This code of contact, it has key as a string. And maybe that's what we want, you know, out there, but we can actually add as much verbosity as we want into our arguments, which helps give more understanding into those LLMs, right? So there's opportunities for us to change that. Um, you can also think of uh, uh, various ways you may rename some of your things inside of your graph, or maybe decisions that you have. It's just a consideration to take. You know, uh, there's a lot of talk about some of the Gartner reports coming out about GraphQL. You know, one of the things Gartner is also predicting is that 30% of the traffic for your APIs is going to come from LLMs and AI. Right? So whether you like it or not, it's going to be one of the clients you have to support in the future. So that's just one thing to kind of think about. But the best part is with GraphQL, it's all already there. Now, the first thing we have to do is we actually have to create an embedded representation of that schema. Um, I'm going to share after the talk uh, all, all of this. I just have in my GitHub. But it's just two code snippets here. The first thing we're doing is we're just reading inside of our schema. And we're parsing our schema, right? This is just from GraphQL. And all we need to do is we take those definitions and we're just creating a representation of the string object, right? You can actually see I'm just taking the start and ending location of the actual schema string we read in. That's the individual doc. That's what we're basically turning into a vector representation. Now, in this, I'm using um, Postgres. So Postgres 16 and greater ships with PG vector in it. So we can use that as our vector store that we can do a vector search against. Um, I'm also using LangChain. Uh, LangChain is a popular community uh, open source library effort. It's got a lot of stuff in it. Um, that makes it pretty easy to work with these things, although you can use just the Postgres library and, and interact with this. Um, this was more for uh, example purposes. Uh, and then what we do is we basically just for each document, um, we're just adding that in to our PG vector store. Uh, we have a model. Um, I'm just using Olama with this uh, locally. So let me open up my terminal. Olama is a very popular uh, tool out there to run a bunch of free open source models. Um, you could run Llama. Uh, you can see I have Llama models here, Mistral. Uh, I believe in the example we're running right now, I'm using the Gnomic embed text. So there are embedding models that are shipped with uh, Olama. It's just more of a great way to get started, try things out for free. Um, but you can also use OpenAI's models. You can use Gemini. You know, all of them kind of have the same thing. They all have you know, different size windows, you know, different performance aspects. We'll get a little bit into that. Um, I also uh, do a little thing of the, the token counting. I think that's just more important. I mentioned tokens. You see a lot in the AI space world. And it's like, what is a token? 
Uh, and there's like a little formula to calculate that out, but it's kind of important, um, mainly for pricing stuff if you're using one of those uh, models that are hosted for you. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. So I'm just going to run this. Uh, I don't know if you all know this. I like showing little tips every here, you know, from DevRel. Uh, I love the little NPM scripts tab that comes with VS Code. If you ever are opening any Node project, if you don't see that and you're like, how did you get that? If you right click on folders, NPM scripts should just pop up if you just have VS Code set up normal. Cool thing about that is you can debug stuff. So I like being able to, you know, maybe, oh, is, is there going to be an error or something that pops up and I can run a little debugger against that. I'm a big fan of debug capabilities. So see, just finished there. So we actually just embedded all the documents from the GitHub schema for free in our PG vector instance locally. That was pretty quick too, right? All right, fancy, fancy. So that's all it is. And you can see that's, you know, I have a try catch block and a lot of brevity here, but 65 lines of code just to embed a GraphQL schema, right? Now there's a lot more you can do, right? We're just showing in this example here the concept of just taking the definitions and substringing those out. Maybe you want to do some stuff with some field level definitions, right? You can break this up into any way. Really what we're talking about here is we're talking about breaking up a GraphQL schema into a vector representation and we're just choosing to slice it by definitions. But you might want to slice it more. It kind of depends on how deep you want to get into this. Right? But now this is something that we can update every time we change our schema. From there, I have a little piece of code snippet that allows us to be that developer and ask that question. So I need to display the top five open issues for the Apollo GraphQL Federation repository. And you can see we're initializing our vector source. So we're connecting to the same Ta uh, table in our PG uh, vector instance. And then one thing we're doing, there's this K argument, this retriever. This is actually how many documents it's returning. So when it does the vector search, it's going to return kind of a, a set of results. It's going to take the top 10. If there's less than 10, it'll return less than 10, but it's taking the most 10 relevant. Um, one thing you could do is you could actually look at those confidence scores and decide you know, what level you want to do. We're just trying to get a starting point for our developers. So it's fine with wherever it's at. Uh, and then we have a prompt. So the prompt in here is uh, something that is a little important. Um, this is how LangChain works when you're actually chaining these things together. So the document we created from the schema actually is just in the form where there's a page content in there and a source. So we're just structuring that. That's kind of just what's in the documentation for LangChain. And then we just actually take our input and we invoke that and we get that result. Now, it takes a little bit longer for this to run. It's not as quick as you saw all of that embedding, but it's pretty quick itself. So if I run that in the background, there's actually an environment variable you can run to make it uh, print out all of the LangChain stuff. I probably should have done that for this demo now that it's sitting here running. Um, but you know, you think about those things in hindsight, right? So I mentioned it takes a little bit longer to run the question. Part of that is because as those documents that get returned, those get added into the context window that gets sent to the LLM, right? So that's why I keep it to 10 documents. You know, if you have too many documents, it's more context tokens. But you can look, here's actually what got returned. Look at that, get top five open issues, repository, issue connection, page info. Looks pretty good inside of there, right? So this is a pretty good starting point inside of that. And really, my dream here is to make just a simple text box that gets a great starting point for any GraphQL schema. So taking these same concepts, these same ideas, I've actually kind of wrapped all of this together. And what I'd like to show you is what I see as my ideal version of the GitHub V5, is what I'll say. Right? So here's what we have on the screen. It's just that text box at the top is so nice to add. Um, I do have Apollo Explorer on here because you know I am from Apollo, so shameless plug. But uh, we're going to create an operation. And I don't want this to be something that I stage. I want it to be real. So can someone from the audience be very brave and maybe think of the GitHub API and a question that you might want to ask to try and get something back? And we'll just see what happens. 
what was what was a user's last pull request? Uh, I you want me? I can put your yeah. I put a user's. That's that's me already prompt engineering. That's that's bad. What was your last pull request? Let's see. Ah. Uh, now, here's the best part about GraphQL and everything. It did generate an operation, right? It didn't generate a valid operation. This is the part of LLMs and AI. And this is when I say trusted but safe. It's because we're not letting an LLM just execute an operation, right? We're just getting a starting point of creating what that is. And you can see the red, little red squiggles. It's saying, hey, this isn't, this isn't a thing. And what it generated, eh, that wasn't good, right? Um, and it, it could change for you know, a lot of things. I think the previous one we had was like, um, what, I need to display the top five results. Oh, you can see I used that one before, right? Um, if we go and try and use something like this, you know, I've put a lot more explanation into my question, right? And you can see it's now generated this operation. I don't have any red squiggles. I can just press the play button, get that data back, right? Um, and that's actually everything from there, right? You can see even here in the body is the Apollo router, right? So I actually have a little login step behind the scenes that we didn't run through right here for this application. But the idea is, you know, imagine your internal developer portal or wherever your developers are trying to explore, understand, get information from your APIs. They now have this little search bar experience that pre-populates um, things inside of here. And, you know, then they can take off from that experience and start to you know, explore the graph and all the normal stuff in there. Uh, now, I will say, you saw this executed a lot faster. Like if we uh, said, like, um, show me my uh, top starred repositories. Let's see. Let's see what that generates. All right? So that one, got it right. I'm not going to run it because I don't want you to see my top repositories. There's like none in there. I'll run it just, just, just so you can see it. Works. Um, oh, yeah, Workbench popped up at the top. That's a very love. Oh, actually, those are all good projects. I love that. OK. Um, but you can see you know, in that it took like about five to seven seconds to execute. Now, in this, I've actually changed from using um, uh, Postgres and uh, Olama. I'm actually using OpenAI. Um, for my model in the question here, and I'm using MongoDB for my vector store. Um, part of that was just for the hosting stuff, you know, like hosting uh, for the actual website um, for this demo is, is really more part of it. Uh, so this is really what I envision as the next iteration, a safe way for us to start bringing AI into what is our API strategy. And really, when you think about bringing AI into your organization, you know, one of the first questions I always hear from teams I work with, people I work with, you know, we, we need to build some revenue bot or something that's going to interact with our customers. Well, the first place to kind of safely learn about AI is with your internal developers. Then once this is working 100% of the time for them, then let's talk about putting it in front of our customers. And then we can have confidence that that's going to be the right thing. So with that, we're at the end of my talk. So I just want to turn it over. I have, I think, about five minutes for questions or anything. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I just don't know how to turn this on. Thanks. Thank you. There you go. It works. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned in your uh, kind of uh, talk about the, the schema that the descriptions were an important part for the LLM and the potentially the vector store to kind of pull up and, and use as a uh, grabbing on point to produce a good, uh, a good query. Did you guys identify anything else that it kind of seemed like it would it would lead to a better result in the actual schema itself to kind of drive from the back end perspective uh, kind of a, uh, a back end first approach to making sure that something like this would would flow smoothly or increase the chances that it would yeah yeah I think what you're getting at is like is there 
anything we explored or anything that kind of leads to more of like schema design from exactly. the upfront point. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So we actually did explore a lot. So um, I've ran this with a couple ones. I've ran it with the Apollo GraphQL API, um, Yelp's API. They have a business API portal um, that I, uh, I signed up and tried through that, and Shopify. Um, so I've tried a couple different schemas out to see. There definitely is differences of what goes on in there. Um, the Yelp schema has, they have two port parts inside of their schema, and it's like one is just a plural version of the word. Um, but the way it ends up getting nested in like another type, they use that same word again. And so the LM can get confused. So hallucinations can happen inside of there. This is where actually looking at the confidence score of what those documents are starts to become really relevant inside of that. Um, I didn't show like the confidence score aspect. That's actually one of the things I, I did when I switched to Mongo. Um, their API actually makes it really easy to just get a score from zero to one with each document that gets returned. And so then I can pick, you know, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that. Um, there definitely was an aspect around schema design. Uh, you know, when I think about at the root level of the query, that's kind of like the first starting point in the LLM's journey of trying to create this operation. And so there's an opportunity for a lot of richness to come inside of that. So if you think like if we're talking meta of schema, you have like a product type, you know, having a product entry point that then triages into what are the various capabilities of the product. You know, we think of, of course, there's like the name, the description, the price, but also like just like what are the things you can do with that product? And as those are in that type, encapsulated in that, it's now giving an LM a, an understanding. Also did experiment with um, doing different vector searches, so that chain showed one search. You can actually pull together multiple, multiple searches. So one thing you could do is you can actually vectorize the schema into two representations, where you do one which is just the query mutation subscription route, and then that is the first set of documents to understand what is that. That then becomes a second search input for the rest of the documents, which would be the fields, the types, everything. And then you're basically pulling out what are the relevant fields and types with that root field that it, you think is most relevant for that. Uh, great question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so if we put, put aside cost uh, apart, uh, have you seen any like drawbacks of just dumping the whole GraphQL SDL into the LAM instead of you know finding what is relevant part. Yeah. Is the model going to be confused if, if we do so? Uh, very curious to what, what you have found during yeah. the experiments. Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the question was really around you know, when we send maybe the whole schema like we did in the co-pilot example, have we seen any issues with that versus more of like the snippets of the SNEVA inside there? Um, it definitely depends on the size of your schema. As the schema gets larger, the hallucination aspect gets much larger. Even when you look at GitHub schema, there's, for example, like project, and then there's project underscore v2. Right? And then we're lucky because GitHub puts comments of what those differences are between them. But without those comments, the LLM has no clue, like, which one do I pick of those two? And it will pick randomly between those two, even if you ask the same question repeatedly <laughs> over it. right? So this is where it is important to have things like deprecations also in your schema. You know, at deprecated is something that's commonly used and should be used, because um, then you're at least getting that feedback in graphical playground, all of the GraphQL IDEs that you would be using inside of there. Um, I will say though, you know, like even like with that hallucination, uh, the LM does a pretty good job with the entire schema inside of it. It definitely does a good job. It's much more of your schema design, to your point. If you have a lot of repeatable things in there, that vector search is really just taking text and creating a vector representation based on that embedding model. Right? So if you have multiple re repetitions of text inside of there, you know, you're going to have multiple documents that are going to have some overlap. And that's going to give you know, maybe a 60% score for you know, some of those like false positives. And that's where that confidence score will become more important. Sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll oh. hand off to you a minute. Oh, yeah. um, I wanted to follow up with the previous question. You know, you're talking about schema quality, and you mentioned comments and that additional 
um, semantics that you bake into um, through this metadata. Have you seen any tools, best practices for creating that? Um, you know, as you know, uh, developers aren't the, the best at documenting things. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, another plug, I have a workshop tomorrow. It's a schema design workshop that I'm delivering. Uh, I will talk a little bit about that. So I think there's a couple aspects around that. One, there's definitely the governance control aspect. You know, I would say this is where you want to have some linting rules inside of there. And, and sometimes a, a linting rule that requires a comment, especially if it's a platform API, I, I don't think there's a problem with that. Um, I always recommend that on platform APIs, you require all of your clients fit a minimum bill of materials of what they have to do to like, if you want to come consume our graph, these are the things you got to do. You got to follow this auth pattern. You got to set these headers so we can identify you in our observability. You know, when something goes wrong, we need to figure that out. And then also, people need to understand what you contribute, right? So when we talk about the graph, we're talking a lot about the consumption, but there's the con contribution side, and you need to make sure that those contributions can effectively be consumed by other people, right? If you're not supporting your one use case, for the most part, there are architectures where you are supporting that one use case, and then you know it's a little different. Um, so linting is definitely a big aspect around that. Most companies I see build some tooling themselves using kind of community-shaped tooling around that. Um, uh, but you know, I'd say that's kind of the, the most I see. The, the next part is definitely governance. Um, what is your process of deciding how a change <coughs> should be on the graph? I think that gets a lot into like the architecture you have. Do you support like a back-end for front-end type architecture? If you do those Developers that create those APIs, they want to have ownership of those pieces. Um, you know, they may not have as much uh, desire to support other people in the organization, right? And so they want to review their changes the way they have them and make sure that's prioritized. Some teams are supporting lots of teams. They want to review all the changes that impact the domain that they are related with. So the scheme of governance becomes very important in there. I recommend that you follow as closely as you can to meet the developers you have today where they are, meaning what the architecture, what the flows of what they have today, you want to map that governance process around the schema to where they are. Um, they're going to be more effective in that architecture and having like a similar feel in that. Because no matter what, you're going to get some of those developers that don't know GraphQL, and they're coming onto the graph. And you want to give them some resemblance of familiarity. One of the things I love like most about Explorer is this copy operation of curl command, because it copies all the variables, all the headers, everything. You can send it to someone who like, doesn't know GraphQL. Then they can get that beginning understanding point of like, oh, it's just a post request with a data field. You know, This is it. Um, yeah. One more question? I may have missed it at the beginning. Did you, do you have this in the hands of developers already? Like, Do you have something similar running internally that you're? could speak to the developer satisfaction of it? Like real world developer satisfaction. Yeah. Um, no, I don't have it. I don't have it running internally. I actually, I've been talking with some people of like sharing the Apollo one. I do have it with our, we have a, a platform API for our product Graph OS, and I've been wanting to release that internally to let people. Uh, the other thing I've been exploring that's on the other side of this is how to generate a persisted query. Um, based on an incoming question. So it's kind of like the both sides of the fence. It's more of like the chatbot use case. Um, we have started rolling out a lot of those pieces. There's actually a little chatbot framework based off of MongoDB's chatbot framework we just released um, that we've started to get feedback from developers. So we're in the early days of that. Um, you know, my hope is actually with this talk to get some more people to start trying out vectorizing the schema. There are a lot of people I know that are following this. Um, uh, and there's um, a project I know going on at Block uh, where they're actually looking at having a co-pilot-like experience like this. Um, but there's more of a discussion interaction versus a one-shot like of what I'm doing here. Um, so I think most teams are trying to get to that uh, in that. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think uh, I have to cut it for the next one, but uh, really appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you can hit me up on the socials or uh, Watson at ApolloGraphKill.com and happy to answer any questions or help any way I can. Thanks. Go to the conference.